Yeah, you're welcome back on VOB Life Fires. I'm here with Barbara Kebe, the founder of the Olive Branch. We've been having a conversation regarding how, where she was born, how she was born, telling us so much about how she came to the Lord. And now we're talking, we're talking more now about the Olive Branch, the vision of the Olive Branch, faith in action. What would you, what would you, what would you say the vision, the core vision of the Olive Branch? The vision is so simple, I mm. But it seems, you know, how would people ever think this was anything like a vision? It was simply to bring people to the Lord's table, mm -hmm. literally to the Lord's table, because the Lord's table is a feasting table full of goodness. And in bringing them to the Lord's table, they would come into an encounter with the real Jesus. Jesus would do the rest. Mm -hmm. All we had to do was bring the people or invite the people in mm. to his table. To connect them to, to, to Jesus. Yes. And so then, we were like a bridge. Mm. If you, Yes. Like a bridge. I suppose going back to um, the Alpha, it was an invitation mm. from somebody I knew and felt comfortable with and liked. Mm. They gave an invitation to Alpha to find out about Jesus. So in mm. a sense, the olive branch was giving an invitation. In fact, when we began, I wanted it to be like, we invite you to come, mm. share the meal. We always began with a very, very short message about Jesus. It would be um, just stories about Jesus, what Jesus had done. So there'd be a different one each week. It was very challenging. Yeah. So, so when you connect people now to Jesus, how do you think the transition goes? Do you work in partnership with churches, or do you refer people to churches, or what? Obviously, the Holy Branch is not a church, and um, how do they grow? Because one of the things I know that the regular uh, vision of a church or any organization should be is to connect, to grow people, and then to begin to serve. So what 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 um what what may you put put in place for people to be able to grow when you connect them to Jesus? That is an extremely difficult and challenging question because I don't think we have really come to the fullness of that. Hmm. I think for me, because we represented different churches, it's not to invite them to one particular church. Although we would always, if people asked the questions, we'd always say, well, there's this church and, you know, I go to this church, um, another volunteer, you go to another church, um, they can tell you about that. So it's more that if you want to go to the next stage, there are some very good churches in Lancaster, you know, and you'll, you'll learn about Jesus, you'll learn about God, um, you'll begin that journey. But I think um, a lot of the people who came, at least in the, those early years, they were still quite away from actually crossing the church threshold. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, and possibly for the rest of the team, was to build up that relationship for with sure. them first. Yeah. So that what then, on the back of that relationship, we could begin to talk about Jesus. Would you say hospitality is very core to the only branch? Absolutely. Can you, I mean, can you tell me more about that? Yes. Well, when we began, we had a meal. Good. We made a meal, and the whole idea was we would sit around one table, mm. sharing that meal together, just as Jesus sat down mm. with anybody. Yes, you did. And had a meal, and yeah. you know, shared that meal, and there's probably conversation over the, the meal as well, mm -hmm. talking about different things that had happened in life. Mm. Um, so for me, it's not, it's the hospitality is the context, but I think also the hospitality in, expresses something that's so deep. It's bringing people into almost a place of home and belonging. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is a safe place to come. Mm -hmm. This is a safe place to share. This is a safe place to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, I think sharing a brew together. Mm. 
It's a great, it's a great uh, comfort thing, isn't it? It's yes. a great um, icebreaker, and it's a great, you know, you relax over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. And you can begin it, a conversation from there. Yeah, people, but it yeah. begins to flow. Mm. So you can't just sit down and have a conversation with without anything. It's um, so I think I, I agree with you, Barbara. I think friendship. Discipleship starts with friendship. You can't actually buy into my faith if you no. don't, if you're not my friend. So it starts from just like you said, you, you mentioned hope, hope, hopelessness. Uh, do you do you do you think um, it's more it's more of what only branch those to give hope to the hopeless people that don't have? They feel like it's, it's finished for them. Well, for me, I was hopeless. Hmm. I was hopeless. There was a point in my life when I couldn't see any future. I had lots of things which people looked on the outside looking in would say were good things, you know, I was married, I had a home, I had a job, I had children, I had family. But none of that at that particular point in my life um, kept me feeling safe and secure mm. because of the things that were happening. I was in turmoil inside. Mm. I was hopeless. I thought there's no future. You know, there was almost that point where I thought, I never came to it, but wouldn't it be better if I didn't, if I could just pull the duvet over my head yeah. and not have to come out and face the world again. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the way that I was going to go. I needed hope. Jesus gave me hope. And this is the message that I wanted to share with other people. Yeah, that's that's but that's Jesus is true. hope. Mm. Jesus is hope. We can find hope in Jesus. We can find a future in Jesus. And uh, this is this is this is. Um, um, I'm sure you would really have a testimony with regards to when your late husband passed, Morris. Um, how did you cope? That must have been a very big blow, Barbara. It was. It was. A complete shock. I knew when I found found him because I did find find him his dead body. Mm. Um, I was the first person there. I knew in that instant when I realised that what I was seeing was him, and he was no longer my husband. Mm. Um, it was shocking. It turned me completely upside down. I knew in that moment that my life would never be the same again. It was completely different, but that day, the last day of his life, um, I learned, and subsequently I learned some important things. God's goodness, God's grace, that beauty can come out of ashes, that God can provide, even in, in, in these circumstances, he can give you the strength to get through them. I experienced that when he died. I would like to just tell you a little bit of, about that last day um, because it might um, give you some idea of, first of all, the impact and also what came out of it, which was totally of God. Mm. There's no other way I can express it. That day was a Friday. It was a beautiful spring day. Um, Deborah, as usual, came to pick me up to take me to the Olive Branch because we were volunteering at the Olive Branch that day. My husband, um, Morris, always came out to say hello to Deborah. She so always had a brief chat with her um, at the roadside. And um, on this particular day, Deborah remembers, um, she always says to him, Morris, Jesus loves you. And this particular day she said that, and he said back, I know he does. And that was so unusual because never had he expressed that truth to me. I'd been a Christian, oh, since 2000. He knew about my faith. We sometimes had very challenging conversations, especially in the early days about faith and 
how could I believe in this fairy tale, you know, an educated <laughs> woman, how could she, you know, and so we did have a few comments. But that day was the only time I knew that he said that. And he also said, and, uh, this is what how Deborah recounted it to me later, I will fight the good fight. Mm. Also unusually that day, I actually prayed with him at the gate. And Deborah said she could see he was listening very intently to the words of the prayer. I didn't usually do that. I prayed for my husband every day. Every day I prayed for him, but I never prayed with him or over him. That was the last time I saw him at the gate. When I came home um, from volunteering at the Olive Branch, um, he was already dead, but I didn't realise that. And as usual, because it was a beautiful day, I took a cup of tea in the newspaper out into the garden to read. And then after a while I thought, oh, I wonder where he is. Is he back home? He must be because his keys were in the back door. I thought, oh, is he inside? So he's got a den at the top of the house and that's where he, sp he spends a lot of time or spent a lot of time um, reading or doing models or, you know, whatever, you know, it's his den, mm. his place. But he wasn't there, so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just walk into the garden. And I can remember coming around, we have a summer house sort of, you know, towards the back of the garden. It sounds grand, it's a shed. And as I turned the corner, I saw what I thought was a wax dummy because that's what he looked like. Um, I thought, in fact, and this is dreadful to think this, that my husband and his friend were playing a joke on me, a horrible, gruesome joke. And then I realised it was him. He had lit a bonfire. He loved, he loved bonfires. I think he inherited that from his dad mm. because his dad loved bonfires as well. So he'd been burning garden rubbish. Um, so what I saw after I saw him lying right at the bottom of the garden, I saw the pile of ashes. That was the, the bonfire completely dead. This is why I always think of beauty from ashes, because that's the image. Um, so and you know, and at that moment I thought, oh goodness. And I cried out for help. My neighbours were next door in their garden. So it's God's provision again. They came immediately across the fence and they took charge. Um, they called the emergency services, um, the ambulance and all the things that needed to be called. And I can remember feeling immense calm, but great shock at the same time because I was answering in this room here um, the paramedics' questions. This arm was jerking up like that uncontrollably. I just <laughs> I could mm. control it. Um, mm. And I remember Deborah came, I phoned her and left a message, she came and she stayed with me and the other people who were here mm. until my daughter and son-in-law came. Um, and then my son and daughter-in-law and my little grandson, who was six months old at the time, they drove up from Surrey mm. that night. Um, they arrived at midnight. And um, I was just tremendously blessed that the family and my closest friend, Deborah, gathered around me. Mm. Because of the way he had died, that road outside, there was a, an, an ambulance, there was a fire engine, there was a police car, and there was another police incident response car, mm. flashing lights. <laughs> um, it was a shock. It was a shocking time. But I know absolutely that God carried me through it. Because mm. throughout everything, I had a great sense of peace. And there was no reason 
why I should have felt that peace and calm because of what had happened was shocking. Um, there was a, an outpouring of love from my church family. So many um, cards with encouragement, scriptures, people praying for me. So I know I was held in his arms by the prayer of other people during that time. I also remember what my another close friend had said, Pat. She had been widowed um, a few years previously. And I can remember her saying, and it always stayed with me, that she felt God had said to her, Pat, if you do widowhood well, other people will be able to do that. Other women will be able to go through that time of the loss of a husband. They would be able to do it in, I suppose, with a sense of being held and a sense of peace. And that's what I felt all the time. When the first time I went back to church as well, it was before Morris's funeral, and um, my pastor, Steve, said to me, he said, you know, Barbara, if you, if you want to say a few words to the church, you can. I thought, goodness, do I want to say a few words? I thought, well, yes, I wanted to thank them. I wanted to thank them for being there, you know, in their prayers and their support. And when I went out just to speak, that wasn't all that I said, and I can't remember exactly what I said. I had nothing prepared. I didn't know I was going to do this. But I think what I did say, I explained what had happened, but I think I said something like, don't leave it too late before making a decision. Because mm -hmm. this has happened, you know, life can be uncertain. Mm -hmm. You know, life can just come to an end unpredictably. Don't leave your decision too late. Make it while you can. And I know absolutely I owe the Holy Spirit used that. He spoke through me. I was given that opportunity to mm. speak mm. about what? about God, I suppose God. Um, to people who already knew that, but so I, I, I feel I always wanted, and I felt this really, really strongly. I wanted my husband to have a testimony. I wanted his death to count, to make a difference. Um, I would say I, I used it, but I don't mean it in a horrible, nasty way. I mean, it gave me the opportunity to speak about God's goodness. Amen, amen. I remember vividly when I was at the funeral, I was there. Oh, yes. I sensed you were so steady. And I was just looking, wow, this must be a special grace over you to be able to remain steady even in this kind of, you know, atmosphere. And uh, can you explain what what happened to you? Because it wasn't natural, um, Barbara. So how did you how did you manage in just in just few minutes? How did I manage? To me, it was an unnatural grace mm, yes. that was given. Um, as I said before, I wanted to use the fact of Morris's death to speak out to people. Um, and to me, in that time, I had read the scripture, I, I knew the scripture, but during that time, I walked the scripture and Amen. experienced the scripture. Wow. Um, you read and you walked it. Wow. That's, hmm. I know I can speak out of that place of having hmm. experienced it and knowing that God is true to his word. Hmm. I'd also, because of, um, because of this, not just Morris's death, but the struggle, the very, very real struggle he had hmm. before, hmm for many, many years with um, depression, 
with anxiety, with panic attacks, um, alcohol dependence. Um, was on, you know, quite heavy antidepressive, um, anti-depression um, medication for most of his life, mm. since his late teens. I didn't want to the... I wanted to be able to speak about the truth mm. of that. Um, and I, it was difficult because I'd spoke with my um, children and I said, this is, what I, this is what I want to do because, you know, to speak about those sort of things, you usually keep them hidden. Um, you don't usually talk about them. You don't usually talk in a big public air, you know, thing like that, and certainly not at a funeral. But that's what I wanted to do because I think that Morris, towards the end of his life, he was more open mm. about, you know, how he felt and what he was experiencing and what he was going through. In fact, the, um, the day he died, he had an appointment at the local alcohol and drug service. Mm. He would um, be going through, I think he'd already been through um, two detox um, processes. But unfortunately, each time he'd gone back, um, into alcohol dependence because of his depression, because of his anxiety, because of the way he felt. And towards the end of his life, um, he could not get through the day without drinking first. He couldn't get up and start the day without having quite a lot of alcohol. Um, I saw that, I saw what it did to him. He saw, he knew what it was doing to him. Um, and I think I wanted to share that with other people. Um, in some way I wanted them to know that, you know, that this is the way it was. This is the way it had been. This is the way he had struggled all of his life. But on that particular day, He'd been making that attempt to get back on track again. So I think the day, that day, he was hopeful. Um, I always feel it was like a robbery, that the enemy had, you know, he felt, the enemy, I'm sure, believed that he had robbed and destroyed and crushed but what he actually did, he gave a great opportunity to speak about God. Amen, amen. And uh, God's grace. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I, I think, I think, uh, Laura, you are a very strong woman of faith. Um, looking at the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, there was uh, a few giants of faith that were mentioned. And I remember that the Bible says that these guys, they stayed steady putting their faith in God, regardless of what they went through. Some of them never saw the transformation in their lifetime. No. They went away, but those things happened. One of them is Abraham. Abraham never saw all those covenants, all those promises in his lifetime, but that never stopped him from following God. Mm. And you did before the um, passing of Maurice. During, you were steady, and you're still, after, still doing it now. And I want you to look at the camera and tell someone today who has just been bereaved, maybe a lady or a man who has been bereaved now. Tell them your experience and just encourage them. Look at the camera now. Someone is watching you, wanting to hear from you. You just want to encourage them. Do you want to do that in just a few minutes? I can just say with absolute, utter assurance and confidence that our loving God can carry you through these situations. And whether it's losing a loved one, you know, that year that Morris died, we would have celebrated our golden anniversary. Um, you know, we were robbed, he was robbed of so much. I was as well, our children were robbed of so much. But 
I knew and I know that you can overcome with Jesus' help. He can give you the strength to get through. You can find peace in the midst of even the darkest circumstances. You can rise above it and Lord, did I want to rise above it. I was not going to let the enemy destroy my life. He wasn't going to have his um, last laugh. And I want to tell you something else about that as well. When I came back into my home, because I stayed with my son and daughter-in-law, um, until after the funeral, in fact, came back after the funeral and they, they came and stayed a night with me. The first day I came back properly, I walked out into the garden and I walked right the way down to where I'd found Morris lying that day and I stood on that spot and I told the enemy what I thought of it all. I was not going to let him rob me of my place of sanctuary, my place of peace. So I loved my garden, I loved being in my garden. That's where I, you know, I just enjoyed reading, I enjoyed mm. watching the birds, listening to the birds. Mm. He wasn't going to have the final word. Amen. Amen. You can't, you can't let it crush you because mm. you go into a downward spiral. Um, and I think also in a way God prepared me for that time of Morris's death. He prepared me in the struggle beforehand. Mm. Because when you are living in a home where somebody is so, so, um, so struggling mm. with the things that my husband was struggling with, you have to rise up every day. You have to rise up every day. Mm. And you have to go out and you have to be an overcomer. Amen. And that's what I believe that God has made me, Jesus has made me to be an overcomer. Um, and you don't become an overcomer through a comfortable life. Mm. You become an overcomer when you're faced with challenges and you get through the challenges. Um, I remember a story I used to read to the children um, mm. about the bear hunt. <laughs> you can't go, you can't go through it you can't go around it, you can't go through, over it, you've got to go through Three, it, yes. you've got to yes. go through it, yes, that's and that's what life is. Yeah. Um, God never, Jesus never, God, Jesus never promised um, that we would have a trouble-free life. Mm. In fact, he warned us that our life would be full of trouble and full of bad things and full of horrible things. What he did promise was that he would give us the strength and Amen. peace to get through it. Amen. Amen. So we have to trust in him, we have to rely on him, rely and trust in his word, that his word is a true word, Amen. and he will get us through. That's very encouraging, Barbara. Thank you very much for that. 